Welcome, this is awesome. Uh, we're gonna be talking about what's new and what's coming in .NET 7. This is a, an exciting morning for me. I woke up this morning and my laptop charger had died. And so I rebuilt my backup laptop with all my demos and slides. And so we'll see what happens. It's gonna be fun. Um, first of all, let's, um, you know, we're talking about .NET. I'm sure you've seen this sort of slide quite a few times. Just to level set, you know, .NET is kind of a, a utility for building just about anything. As a, as a programmer, it's, a, it's kind of a nice balance of light and easy to get started with, and then you can use your skills to build games, web apps, you know, uh, embedded devices, all kinds of stuff. And so I love that about being a .NET developer. I can, you know, take my skills and just say, oh, I think I'll build a phone app today, right? You know, it's kind of fun. Um, so it's uh, cross-platform, it's open source, it uh, runs on Windows, Mac, Linux, all the other things. Let's do this. So today I really just have two points. I want to talk about, you know, let's get you current on .NET 7, meaning get your apps on .NET 7 and take any advantage of the .NET 7 features. And then let's look forward to what's coming in .NET 8. So uh, I feel like sometimes at Microsoft we jump too far into .NET 7's coming, .NET 7's coming, .NET 7 is coming, and then it comes out and we're still like, forget about that, .NET 8 is coming, .NET 8 is coming, right? And the real world is, you're not running your apps on .NET 8. Let's talk about what you can run on today, okay? So we're gonna do a little of both. We're gonna talk about what's, what's here now and what's coming. Um, here's the overall schedule, right? We have a new .NET every November. And for some people, that's awesome. I love new treats. I love, you know, hot new bits, that's cool. But I do understand for some people that's a little overwhelming. It's a bit much, right? Because of a few reasons. One, um, you've got applications in production to support and you worry about, okay, you know, am I gonna be out of support? How long do I have to update? And, you know, I just finished updating to .NET 6 and then .NET 7 and then now .NET 8. You know, it's, it's work to do, right? Um, I think also when you see all the blog posts that say, here's all these new features, on the one hand, that's cool. On the other, it's, it's burden on your brain, right? Because you, your amount of the .NET knowledge that you knew just got a lower percent, right? You knew this much, and then a new thing got added, and you, you don't know this much, right? And then a new thing got added, and you know half. And then, you know what I mean? And so knowing everything about .NET, it's hard to kind of keep up with that. And I think also it can feel like, um, <coughs> it can feel like I can't get on .NET 7 because, heck, I don't understand minimal APIs or I'm not ready to use all these new features. C Sharp 11, I just learned C Sharp 9 feature. You know what I mean? And so, um, so I want to kind of talk through some of that. But the big main thing I want to talk about is just get on the new version. You don't have to use the new features. You can just update your app and you're running on the new thing. So. Um, I'm going to start with two quick demos, and one is on incremental updates to .NET. So, um, first of all, there's this this really cool thing called uh, the web or the upgrade assistant, and it used to be a command line tool. It was pretty neat. Now there is a console or there is a Visual Studio extension that's built in that can upgrade your applications. And it's based on our experience from our consulting services at Microsoft that go out and work with large clients and upgrade their large .NET framework, other applications, to run on modern .NET. And one neat thing about this is it's built using this thing called YARP, which is a great funny name, but it stands for yet another reverse proxy. And the idea is that you've got applications that are running on .NET framework and you can't just take that application down while you're upgrading, right? You need to keep both going. And so what, this allows you to do that. So let's just, uh, let's jump into it. We'll, uh, we'll check out an app that does that. So this is my, uh, let me see. This is an ASP.NET MVC5 application running on .NET 4.8.1. You thought you were gonna see cutting edge applications, we're taking you back. Um, so what I am going to show you with this is that there's, I've got the .NET Upgrade Assistant installed, and I'm going to, when it opens, I'm going to right click on the project. So here you see, like for instance, this is my web config, right? Nice memories. Um, so I'm going to right click, I'm going to say Upgrade. Okay, so it says, 
side by side. I'm going to create, if I had an existing ASP.NET Core, I could put it in there. I don't. Um, let me see. I already have one, so that's fine. Let's call it two. <laughs> you know where I'm going next, three, right? Now you'll figure out my passwords. I'm in trouble. OK, so what it's doing, you can tell I practiced my application exactly one time, right? Um, so here it's going through, and it's updating my application. So it's going through my MVC app. It's discovering my controllers, my views, my um, dependencies, and it's updating all those things. So it has cr it's creating a side-by-side -side ASP.NET Core app that then I can start to move my logic and things into. All right, so right now I've got an empty ASP.NET Core app. So the next step is, I click Done, and it says, here is your percent. This is actually a little discouraging. I'm 100% .NET Framework still, basically. OK, but now let's go in and let's say, oh, let's just click here, Upgrade Controller. Which controller? Well, this is the only controller in the app, so that's an easy choice. So it goes through. It says, here's your controller's views, et cetera. Update, update, update. OK. And now I can run my application, and what will happen is I have updated my home controller, my views, et cetera. Now, if I run it, I still have to copy over some static assets, right? So it's actually not going to look pretty. But it's actually about two minutes away from completely being migrated. Now, this is File New Project, MVC. But I will tell you a story. I have, on my team, I worked with James Montemagno, and he, had, he runs the, or was helping to run the Planet Xamarin uh, website. And one day he asked for some, he said, hey, take a look at this. It's not running. Can you see if something's wrong? And I'm like, I'll tell you what's wrong. It's running on MVC5, you know, like, let's get this updated. So I was like, I'm taking the rest of the day and I'm finishing it. And in about three hours, I had the app updated from MVC5 to .NET 7, running in Azure, right? And that was not a pretend site. It had Autofac, it had a bunch of new Git packages that weren't available anymore, et cetera. But using the upgrade assistant, done, done, and done, OK? So that is my first demo. I'm quite excited. I, I honestly think this is, if you fall asleep now, you've, you've picked something cool up. I do want to stop debugging. Yes, I do. OK. I want to show one other very silly demo, which is here is an application that is a .NET 5 app, right? Here is the very difficult upgrade to .NET 7 for an admittedly very simple app. Right? I'm running on .NET 7 now. That's it, right? Now, I get it. You know, you may have some things to check out. But, and if you've been burnt in the past and you like had, oh, man, I moved from .NET Core 1 to .NET Core 2, yeah, I'm sorry. I did it, too, and it was hard, right? But we've really done a lot of work to make it, now that we're releasing every single year, we're really working hard to make it so that an update should take you a day, you know, <laughs> like not, it shouldn't be a big, a hard problem, right? Okay, enough of that. But that is my main sales pitch, I got to tell you. Okay, so let's talk about why you want to get on .NET 7. So, is it gone? Is it gone? Sharon, yes. Okay. One huge thing, and I'm sure you hear us talk over and over about this, but performance. Performance is just part of the way we build .NET. It's, it's part of why .NET Core was designed. Uh, so it's, it's really a key focus. Um, and so like you'll see, you know, kind of huge improvements. Um, I don't know if any of you read Stephen's blog post. He writes about performance improvements. And his blog post, it was like 200 pages printed out. It was ridiculous. Um, but it's, it's, it, he includes all the benchmarks. It's all there. It's incredible. And then the other teams have started paying attention. I think they get paid by the word or something. But they, now they're writing posts. So there was another one very similar about ASP.NET performance improvements and Maui performance improvements. So this is, and again, I showed you that demo of updating one character from 5 to 7. Those performance improvements happen automatically. I don't have to change my app. I don't have to reuse a new thing. It's just kind of like strings get faster. You know, <laughs> like that's cool. So performance, um, I think I have a few more slides on that. But um, here's our kind of w one challenge I have when I'm talking about what's new in .NET 7 is there's 20,000 commits in .NET 7, right? 
And so it's all over the place. It has tons of stuff. And then as it comes down to the conferences or it comes, you know, we're like, hey, we need a slide. Okay. So we try and come up with, you know, here's some general themes. Here's some real things that we think we solved or made better. Um, so here's what we look at for .NET 7. You know, there's um, so, some of the support for platforms. So like ARM 64 um, and then performance improvements for Linux. It's included in Ubuntu by default, um, which is pretty neat now. Um, so you know a lot of a lot of modern uh, things, including uh, focus on cloud or uh, cloud native applications, um, code simplicity with C sharp 11, and also our project templates. So you'll notice you know we now have with top level statements and uh, implicit usings. You'll see uh, your your program CS has gone from this long to you know this long, which I like. Um, so and you know the real idea is that. Code that is noise kind of is distracting, and it just kind of, you know, let's focus on code that actually adds to your application that builds something. Um, and uh, yeah. So yeah, I think I talked about a lot of this. I'm, I'm going to go fast. It's going even faster. Performance, okay, I want to get to my demos, so. Um, this is, you know, like, uh, we have to show our comparison. This is a real kind of focus, too, and it's, it's really continuing to improve .NET. I, every time I'm like, wow, they finished off the performance thing now. I mean, they can't get any faster than this, and the next time it's like, oh, we doubled our speed, you know, so. Um, uh, so there's API performance. I think I have one on gRPC as well, any framework. So, again, this, the sales pitch here is just, update your version number, and you get all those things we worked on, you get those performance improvements in your application. We also, um, I don't have slides on this, uh, but we have a blog post series that we do with people inside of Microsoft, large teams, the Bing team, the team's um, back end runs their services on .NET, and um, uh, Azure Active Directory, and they're large, you know, I mean, like some of them do billions of requests per month. You know, I mean, they're like really uh, huge applications. And for them, getting a 10% performance improvement saves, you know, potentially like millions of dollars, right? And so, um, and also like makes their apps more reliable, more scalable, et cetera. And so they have been doing these series where they have been posting about here's what we did we upgraded our application and boom, you know, and they show their performance graphs, et cetera. So that's pretty cool. All right, so moving on from, the, from uh, the performance stuff, one of the things that we've shipped with .NET 6 and kind of made better with .NET 7 is uh, minimal APIs. So the reasoning behind some of this was looking at when people were getting started with .NET. We, you know, we would talk to students. We would say, hey, check out .NET. It's rad. You know, come have fun. And then they'd say, OK, using this, using that, using that, oh, OK. Namespace, what's a namespace? You know, and then it's like, well, you just put it there. We need a namespace. Okay, well then, you know, and th there's all this code and it's like, well, in Django, I write two lines of code and I have an app. Like, yeah, you know, we, we don't do that. So why not? So that was part of the, the thinking behind this. So minimal APIs don't replace uh, API controllers. If you love API controllers, I kind of do too for a lot of applications. They're still there, and they're actually picking up features. As we add features to minimal APIs, then we say, oh, let's put this in controllers as well, right? So, but those you know, are pretty well documented. Controllers are documented. Um, APIs are kind of a new take on it. So the idea is just a few lines of code. It's a very functional style. So it's mapping um, from a route to a lambda or to a, a little bit of code that's a, that does something. Um, why would you use this? In some cases, if you just want a light, simple app, right? You just, you've got a few endpoints, you've got something, so that's one reason. Another is that it's a style you prefer. Now, for, um, my first take on this was, I don't prefer this with no structure, right? Because this is one endpoint. What if my app has 50 endpoints? Is it gonna be this long? And then is it, you know what I mean? It's, and, and the real important thing is, it's just code, right? So this, where it says, hello world, I can abstract that into another, you know, I can put things in folders. And we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit more in a demo. Um, but that, that's the idea there. Um, moving on, moving on. Okay. 
I've got a lot to get through, so I'm kind of, I had some, and we already talked about Upgrade Assistant. Okay, I'm skipping now into some demos that I wanted to show with .NET 7 features, and then we'll wrap up with some Blazor stuff before we go to .NET 8. Okay, so, .NET 7 features. Okay, close these out. Okay, so I'm starting with a minimal API in .NET 7, or .NET 6, sorry. So this was actually shipped in .NET 6. Here we've got a, an endpoint, product endpoint. So this is an ex example <coughs> of a minimal API, right? So this is, um, this is one way, to, like, you'll see demos and it's like, oh, it's all going in your program CS. It doesn't have to. We introduce uh, endpoints that allow you to move that over to the side, right? So your endpoints now, you can say Mac product endpoints, and your endpoints themselves are here, and then they just have, they're an extension method um, off of iEndpoint route builder, and, um, or off of, sorry, it's hooked up as an extension method. Um, and then it's a few lines of code. So we've got this return something off of map get. And then you see a few lines here that say map tags and map with name, et cetera. And that's to light up features in OpenAPI. So it allows for um, better documentation of your application. It allows for also for better interoperability with things that speak OpenAPI. Um, so this is okay. But when I started using this, and I actually like was one of the people complaining to the team, I'm like, hey, I miss having attributes on a class. And in fact, like, how do I attribute really any of this? Because this is just a bunch of, of calls, like method calls, right? Um, and, and they're just a bunch, of, they're static methods off a static class. So what am I doing, you know? And so that's one of the things let's look at in, with minimal APIs in .NET 7. Okay, I'm going to scaffold out off of my product controller. Did you know, by the way, that we have scaffolding for minimal APIs? That is kind of neat. So, fingers crossed. So, I have a simple product class, creating an endpoint. I'm creating a DB context. You don't have to, you don't need a DB context. I'm just showing that example. I'm including here Open API and typed results. Okay, so we'll see what that lights up. Um, open API, we showed already the kind of with tags and with name stuff. Typed results is a new feature in .NET 7 that allows for returning um, richer information about different kinds of results. So let's say I um, post information to the server. What could happen there? Well, one is it could succeed, and in that case, I actually want to return the ID of the thing I posted. Right? You, you created something, created successfully, here's your uh, HTTP response code, and here's the idea of what you created. What about if it failed? Well, I have to return an uh, HTTP response code, but what if I also return problem details, right, and told you why it failed? Well, a problem is that .NET methods can return one thing. So how do we package that up neatly? Um, and so, that's, that's something that typed results can do. So here's an example. Look at that. So here we have typed results, okay or okay with a model or not found, right? And so it's a rich way. Oh, and if you look at these, here's, here's what the response is. It's a task that includes results and not found. I've been told the kind of nerdy way to describe this is it's, a, um, just, it's kind of like a discriminated union, right? So that's kind of neat. Another thing that we did here was we included a lot more uh, open API kind of features and things that explain to open API, here's what we built. So, so that's uh, an advance, or that is an update with minimal APIs. We've kind of looked, oh, one other huge one was, is map groups. So remember I was complaining about, hey, it's just an extension method with, with a bunch of things. How do I reason about them, right? And so here we actually have this thing called groups. And now on the group, I can do things with that group. So we're already doing a few things with it. One is we say with tags product, and I don't have to put that on every single endpoint anymore. Everything in a group applies that tag now, right? So back with the old one, we had to go for every single one with name, with name, with name. 
right, with name. Like it's just over and over. So this one, uh, this one, or with tags, it was with tags. But so that is nice. Another thing is I can go through and I can say dot, and I can add things to the entire group, right? So that's fancy. Another thing I can do is, here I'm defining the prefix for the entire route, for the routes for the entire group, right? So now for this one, this slash is actually, says it goes API product slash is, is the git thing, right? Or here if I say, for all of these, I don't need to define anything more in the route. If I do, it just applies on top of slash API slash product. Does that make sense? So it makes it a lot less repetitive compared to these where all your routes include API product, API product, API product. Cool? So that is that. Um, let me see. I also had in here some other fun stuff. We have, I think that, I don't think I broke it yet. Let's take a look at here we've got applied um, rate limiting and caching. So those are super easy to hook up. You know, they don't sound super, it's like, okay, rate limiting, caching, but it's actually super easy to now drop middleware on your, any of your controllers. So I'm showing it with an API. You could use this in Razor Pages. You can use it you know, across all of ASP.NET Core. Um, so this is, a, this is a one liner to hook up response caching. I say add response caching, and then down below I say use response caching. So that's it. And then for the rate limiting, I can hook up this rate limiter just by saying something like add rate limiter. And then I can down below say use rate limiter. So it's very, very kind of simple. Now um, here, then because I've got that use rate limiter set up, I can require that on this endpoint and it'll limit the amount of requests. So the way that rate limiter is set up, it says within 12 seconds, a client can make four requests. So if somebody's like, if a spider's hitting me, if whatever, somebody's abusing my endpoints, end then this will say you get four, four responses and then nothing more for 12 seconds, right? Okay, so let's run this real quick and check it out. Okay, so first of all, there's, our, there's this. Okay, let's see if I can get in trouble. So here I keep hitting requests, and see, it's not, only, it's not that it's just caching. It is preventing, it's, it's spinning, it's waiting, right? So, um, so that's the idea. And then after that times out, then it'll let me go. So, so very, very simple rate limiting setup, right? If we go to Swagger, I think also there we can see the git. We should see some caching on it. Um, but the one other thing I want to see, I think that one too, you see there? I tried to do too many requests and it rate limited me. So the other nice thing here is we've got more um, support now because of all those things for the group. It's got really nice kind of API endpoint, or uh, really kind of nice support for open API and what it understands. Um, so here, like for instance, on any of these, it'll, it understands, okay, you, you can return different kinds of results and it'll package that up cleanly. I think that's the main stuff I wanted to show there. Um, I do, while we're in here, I do want to show off another few kind of neat, just kind of packaging features we've got included. So one is uh, built-in uh, SDK, con or uh, built-in container support. So it's SDK container support. Um, so the idea here is, this is a very simple one, um, but if I go .NET publish, and because I've turned on these properties here, it can build a container without me having to build a Docker file, without me having to use all the kind of Docker, it's just built into the SDK now to be able to build uh, containers. So that's super useful. There's also a NuGet package you can use to, uh, to enable that, but you don't have to if you just set it right in, the, um, right in the thing. And the NuGet package is something like, I forget, it's, it's 
It's like uh, Microsoft.sdk.container support or something. So, so cool. Um, there's that, there's that, I think. One other thing I did want to show, there's also AOT support. So we've been including AOT support all over the place. And this comes over from work that started um, from Xamarin and moving into Maui. And the idea is all this uh, ahead of time compilation. And this really um, can help trim your application down. So they actually, I'm jumping ahead to, uh, um, I think some of these apps, you know, we're talking say like 10 megabytes or something, but the, uh, what, what they're looking at for .NET 8, they have applications that are small enough they can fit on a floppy disk, right? So this is because of, it can very aggressively look at everything in the framework that your application is not using and remove that. So that is super cool, and you can do that here just with publish AOT in your, um, in your uh, build, <laughs> as a build property. Let me see if there's anything else I want to show there. I think that's it. OK, <laughs> some other neat th um, This is hard because there's like tons of neat stuff. There's, there's uh, Maui. There's, uh, you know, um, there's really cool things for uh, like across the platform. Um, another thing that just had tons of features in .NET 7 was, um, was Blazor. So Blazor has just been getting a, a huge amount of things. Blazor hybrid is super interesting. And, what that allows you to do is build a desktop or a mobile application using Blazor uh, syntax, and you're writing you know, HTML, CSS, and C Sharp, and you're building your UI. And then it's running on desktop and, and phones, et cetera. Now, you would be tempted, as I was, to think, oh, it's basically just hosting a browser. But that's not true. It's actually using, it's kind of, if you think of it, it's like a canvas where it's drawing the UI using Blazor. But all the kind of, all the operations, everything is running native, right? So it's any, any actual operations, any interaction with the device, that's all native uh, interaction. So it's basically like a native app that just has UI interactions drawn using Blazor. So that is, is really useful uh, for a few, a few cases. One is, if like me, you are more comfortable writing HTML and CSS and, and like building with Blazor than you are in building with XAML or, or you know, other desktop technologies, heck, I'm happy to be able to build a phone app really quickly with stuff I know, right? So that's great. Also a nice use case is to be able to share UI. So you actually can pull in a Blazor view or component and use that within a desktop app. Um, a lot of other things, but I'm going to move on quickly. OK, so um, yeah, and I just realized I was not ready. Before I go, I think, am I ready to go on to .NET 8? I think I am. Um, and I don't want to jump to that too quickly. OK, in .NET 8, let's talk about some of the fun stuff that's there. Um, And let's see if I get that. OK. Yeah, let's move on to .NET 8. So one nice usability thing is, and this will seem super simple, but when I saw this demonstrated, I, I couldn't believe it. Like, OK, so this, here's that in .NET 8. Let's take that thing. Do I still have a .NET 7 app open? Yes. So let's go into .NET 7, put that in my program CS. Throw that around here. Okay. So, do you notice something different between that and that? So here, it's basically a string, right? These routes are just long strings. There's no validation. There's no kind of. It's if I make a typo, if I type reg, right? It's, that's, it's just a string, and nobody knows until I run my application. So what's really cool here is this is, this is uh, and this takes advantage. It's Visual Studio is lighting this up. Uh, other other uh, IDEs can take advantage of that. It's Roslyn based, um, but this is actually, um, you know, this is now using using features that are built into 
Like I, I can go in and I can say, okay, this is an int. And it actually like says, um, it understands that type, right? So this is taking advantage of a, um, a feature, I forget the exact name for it, but there's this whole feature where they're able to, to understand strings. It's, it's, um, so for instance, you'll also see this with like regular expressions defined as a string and being able to do IntelliSense on a regular expression and say this is what it means and help you, you know, if you type, start typing like a date regular expression, it will help you fill that in. So, okay, cool. So that is one really neat thing. Um, another neat thing that is included in .NET 7 but is getting cooler in .NET 8 is the quick grid. So let's go, uh, let's go here. I have a few too many tabs open. So, um, and I had a really cool demo, but it's on my dead laptop. Um, but the general idea here is if you want to create a quick grid, right? You just want to create something simple. Um, this is just a few lines of code in, um, to do that, right? So we actually did, I taught a, a workshop on ASP.NET the past two days, and we we're building a movie browser application. And the first thing we wanted to do is just verify that the data was there, right? So I could like debug, write it out, or I could go and create a table, and I could go in and map all the things and take a while. We actually ended up just doing this. So this is all it takes to define a quick, simple table. Um, and it's, it's like this is a simple case. There's other support for other features. There's, um, there's uh, virtualization, which is pretty amazing. So the idea here is this is scrolling through you know, many thousand records and it loads on demand. Um, so it's, it's able to handle a huge amount and respond very quickly. Um, I don't know, is it food? No. Foo, right? So it's able to like very rapidly work through a lot of those. Um, filtering, sorting, styling. Here you can see our beautiful designers have been at work. So this is, this is super cool, I think. Um, just as a, um, this was included as an experimental feature in .NET 7. The way that they define this as, they said it's experimental, meaning we're going to maybe change it as we productize it later. So we feel like it's ready to use, have fun using it, but note, you know, there may be some breaking changes between .NET 7 and .NET 8. So the, the feature in .NET 8 is it's included in the box with, with, with uh, Blazor, um, totally supported and all that. So that's that. Um, other stuff, let me see, so that's... Okay, so now also let's go on in Blazor. We have oh, I'll do after that. Okay, so Blazor United, that is an exciting thing. It is also a little bit complicated, and it is also not easy to see right now. Um, I actually tried to install it on this computer, and it said I needed 16 gigabytes of space to do that, and so it did not actually happen. Um, but here's the thing, you. Um, you, the, the idea is to integrate, is this not active, it's not active, there we go. Okay, so we've had for a while uh, server-side rendering, right? And so this is your traditional MVC and Razor Pages application. So that works great, it's a tested, uh, tried technology, it works well for a lot of use cases. Actually, most apps you browse on the internet today are server-side rendered, right? It scales well, it's cacheable. Um, but for, for, um, for other cases where you need, so yeah, um, for other cases where you need more interactivity, then you have the client, uh, client side rendered. So this is Blazor, and then, you know, equivalent would be like, you know, React and Angular, et cetera, right? So you always have to make this choice. And it's, um, it's, it's great that there's two good options, but it's also sometimes kind of frustrating because you end up kind of, you pick one, and if you guess wrong, you're wrong, and you also can't use the two together very well. Now, you kind of can. Like, for instance, on the .NET website, we have a section of the site that we built with Blazor. So we have .NET Live TV, where we have our community stand-ups and our other shows. That part of the site is very interactive. It's continually, like, checking with YouTube APIs and stuff, and so, that actually is built with Blazor. Um, and it's integrated into a, a, 
a Razor Pages application. But honestly, it was a little tricky to do. And we, we actually ended up like calling up Dan Roth and we're like, hey, Dan, help us out because we're not sure what we're doing here, right? So it doesn't really scale for everyone to call Dan Roth. And so you know, what, what if we could take that um, to a better place? And so that is this fancy little, yay, OK. So we originally, like the product team, the, you know, the engineers working on it, they're like, Blazor United. And they made cool videos about it and um, you know, started talking about it and posting about it. And then the, the marketing folks actually were like, we don't want you to call it Blazor United. Just call it Blazor because we're, you know, we have too many product names and it's very confusing and all that. So, so I'm supposed to call it the Blazor Unification Effort. But it's Blazor United. So, um, so the idea here, yeah, the, the best of server-side rendering with Razor components. So this means, um, so like history lesson or, or you know, just kind of context on Blazor. When Blazor first came out, it was an experiment at a NDC conference, NDC Oslo, and Steve Sanderson uh, was looking at what if we could get .NET running in WebAssembly. WebAssembly was very new at the time, not really widely supported. He hacked around, um, he kind of got it to work. And it's like, wow, this is neat. And everyone's like, well, that's crazy, amazing, you know? Um, and then as they started building it out, the way that it was talked about is write a web app without any JavaScript. And I think that was kind of a little unfortunate because, I mean, JavaScript it can be annoying, but JavaScript's cool too. Like there's an ecosystem of JavaScript uh, you know, packages and, and, and tooling, and there's a bunch of JavaScript developers out there doing good stuff. JavaScript's not necessarily bad. It's just nice to have the option to write client-side stuff using C Sharp too, right? And reuse my NuGet packages and reuse my, like, I'm okay at, I'm actually not that good at JavaScript, but I, I know C Sharp pretty well. At least when I get an error, I know what to do to fix it, right? So, so it's nice to use my skills and, and reuse my code and stuff. But that was kind of the early days of Blazor. And over time, what ended up happening is Blazor is built on these Razor components. They're components that are um, written in the Razor language. And so what's really neat with that is those components kept getting more and more powerful. You can just do more and more amazing stuff with Razor components, right? And so I really started thinking of Razor or, or Blazor as doing neat stuff with Razor, right? It's not so much of JavaScript's hickey, I hate it. It's like, fine, Java, I can use, we use JavaScript on the .NET website in that Blazor app. We use it to interoperate and do some other stuff because it was just easier to do it that way, right? There's great JS, JS interop in Blazor. But, but the component model is super neat. So anyways, um, what if we could like, take those Razor components and do more with them? And we've already started, I mentioned earlier, uh, or a Maui hybrid, right? So this is the um, doing Blazor, uh, Maui applications using the Blazor front end. So that's taking our Razor components and putting them on a phone, right? But what if we could do more and take our Razor components, not just Razor syntax, we've already had Razor pages and, and you know, MVC uses Razor syntax. What if we could take a whole Razor component and put it on the server, but server-side render it and stream it to the client, right? And so there's one where it's just it's rendered on the server and sent to the client, but what if we could actually stream it down? So the idea here is in a lot of, of um, applications, say we're waiting for a while on a database call. And we've got a lot of information, we've got everything ready. We were, we're ready to stream everything down, but we're waiting on finishing, you know, finishing building the page. What if we could send down most of the HTML and then update it and just continue sending that out? So not requiring a JavaScript callback to say, hey, are you done, or, any, or loading async, or whatever. What if we could just streaming render down to the client? Um, and then do more to enhance kind of navigation and interaction because of those features. Um, and also, what if we could take it and not look at, like, sometimes in an app, you've got part of the app that doesn't need to update at all. It doesn't need to be very interactive. Um, and that could be totally server-side rendered. And then there's other parts of the app that are completely client, you know, very interactive. We need that all on the client. And then there's other parts of the app that's a little of both. It's a few different components, and we want them all to uh, work differently, right? So 
the, the idea there, they started doing these experiments and looking at you know, what, what is the modern technologies that, um, that browsers offer, what are other platforms looking at doing, and they actually saw that they were in a really good place because they had the Blazor server model and the Blazor client, the Blazor WebAssembly model. So it's actually something where they're able to kind of hook those up together pretty well. Um, so yeah, with server-side rendering, um, the, ser the HTML, pa I love that. I got to go back. Okay. Look, we didn't wrap the L. I got to fix that. After this thing's over, I'm going to like go hide in the corner and fix that slide. Um, but yeah, so we, we package up the HTML on the server and send it on down. Right? Uh, with streaming rendering, uh, the idea here, you know, we've got a long database call, we send HTML down, and then we continue to update it. Yay! Okay. That's just going to bug me so much. I'm going I'm to wake up in the middle of the night and like, be sad about that. But not like when I woke up in the middle of the night last night because there was music going until 5 a.m. It was crazy. What was going on? Was it you throwing a party, sir? That was out of hand. I need you to keep it down tonight a little bit. So... I mean, okay, so then um, the, on the bright side, the, the loud music caused me to wake up, check my laptop, and see that the charger had died, and I had time to build my new laptop, so. Okay, and then, you know, uh, advanced uh, navigation. Wow, we've got, there it goes. Um, so being able to also add interact. I'm just gonna skip over this. Um, so then, so part of the idea here is being able to annotate pages of of your Blazor site. Now, I'll be honest, I'm mostly showing slides here partly because I'm not able to show a huge full demo. We're at preview three of .NET 8. And so I can show you, I can talk about it, I can show a few short demos of here's some stuff we're working on, um, but I'm not able to go super, you know, I can't actually run the whole app. Um, we do have some on the ASP.NET community stand-up where they demoed some of this. So if you go to live.net, or just go to the .NET website and click on Live TV. Um, it'll have a link to the community stand up there. And they actually went through and demoed some of this. But in order to do it as a private branch, you have to build everything. You need tons, of, you need about, apparently 15 gigabytes of C++ build tools. I don't know what they're doing over there. Um, so anyhow, I'm demoing with slides for this part. Um, so it would be nice to be able to like, put a little S on some of our pages and put a little W on some of the pages, right? Server-side and WebAssembly and some of our components. Mark, this one is server-side and this one is WebAssembly. But what's even better is what if we could pick at runtime? And we could say, okay, based on whatever, this client is a premium client. They get everything, I don't know, on the client. Or, you know, whatever. This, or based on this, uh, this operation's already completed, server-side render it, right? So being able to make those decisions at runtime. So that would also be nice. Um, and so here's the crazy part. I gotta re redo this because I, I didn't quite cover this. The render mode at runtime is nuts because basically what we do is when you first connect to the page, it's server-side renders, right? It's, and, and it's actually keeping a WebSocket open. So this is basically the Blazor server model. Um, Blazor server is actually super responsive. Like when you go to, let's go to a website. Let's go to a Blazor website. I'll pick my favorite Blazor website, which is moths.coffee. That is James Montemagno's coffee company. Now it's cool, but see, we had a little spinny thing. It was pretty fast, but it's like, you know, do I need that all the time? You actually don't get that if you use Blazor server, right? Because Blazor server sends down tiny bit of HTML, establishes a WebSocket connection, and then once the WebSocket connection's established, then the, the um, interactivity, like the application basically runs on the server and just sends updates, patches down to the browser. Um, and so it's able to, to go very quickly. So that's very good for first run, for when I first connect to the site, very quick, right? But then if I'm on the site for a long time, I, it's not quite as interactive and I'm keeping a WebSocket connection open and so that doesn't scale well. So the, I, the crazy idea here is to actually when you first connect to the site, you get the, the server-side rendering uh, and you get the um, WebSocket. But then, as you're working, it's streaming over the WebSocket in the background. It's streaming the WebAssembly. And then, when it's down, it switches modes. 
and now it's able to run off of the WebAssembly. So you get basically the best of both. I think I'm done with my fancy slides, and I'll show you a few little demos I've got. Yeah, okay. So the few demos I've got on that are, first of all, there's this one on, Um, that's not it. Uh, sorry, just uh, server-side rendering. There we go. So this is a Blazor application, but it's a little bit different. If you've built Blazor before, there's a, an app host, there's a, a router set up. Um, so you'll, you'll go into your like, app component, you'll look at the router, and the router is going to have all this stuff, and it it's actually doesn't feel, very, doesn't feel like ASP.NET, really, right? It feels like its own sort of separate thing. So what's really crazy here, this is a Blazor application, but if you look at it, this is, this is kind of my sort of standard middleware, right? So here, it's got this neat thing, map razor components to main layout. Um, and it's just kind of running the application then. So it's, it's doing these extra things, add razor components, add controllers. Um, but then, you know, if I go in and I look at my app, I basically, I just have, you know, some uh, kind of standard thing here. So, so if I run this now, we'll see actually we just get HTML. And if I dig in, I'm not going to see... Um, I'm not going to see WebAssembly downloaded. I'm not going to see any kind of like WebSockets establishes or whatever. So this is the server side rendering stuff. This is you take these are Razor components rendered on the server. Um, you know, not functional, right? Because it's server side rendered. So this is just this is a purely render, a server side rendered thing. And if we go here, let's go to our network. Right? So there's no like WebAssembly stuff or anything getting downloaded. So that is that. And um, the other things that I have to show with that, there's, there's one which is, um, so I do have the non-running application, which is best for your recipe. So I'm not able to actually run this, but I can show the kind of the, the style of, of um, annotating things. And, where they're going, and they're still kind of early on, kind of figuring out and listening to um, to people on what we should build and how it should work. Um, but there's some some crazy stuff about this. Um, so, first of all, you'll notice there's this program.server.cs and program.webassembly.cs. So there's different setup for the different models, and it's able to kind of build both of those, right? So here's your kind of more standard WebAssembly style. Here's my, that I showed earlier kind of with the, the um, standard middleware set up for, and endpoint routing and all that stuff uh, for uh, server side, right? And then, you know, digging around, you'll see like, there's, there's some in here, and I'm not sure, actually like, I'm not gonna make you sit and watch me, but there's some in here where we do like, for instance here, web component render mode dot auto. So this is one of those, that example, where it'll say automatically, you know, pick. Start on the server and render down to the client. And then we can go in, I don't, I don't know, we may have some others that say like this one is, um, the idea is to be able to annotate them and say this one's client, this one's server, right? So that is pretty neat. Um, there's one other one that's kind of related it's not, it's not directly off of that, but it's kind of a nice kind of thing that fell out of it, which is HTML rendering. Um, so that is... This is something actually people have asked for for a long time. They're like, hey, I would like to take Razor Markup and I want to render it to HTML and I don't want to run a website. Like maybe you're generating emails or maybe you're like creating reports or something, right? And so that's this example here. So here we've got a component and, you know, just saying the time. 
and here that's writing out. So the idea is just to be able to create a renderer and render the component. So, so this is just a you know, very simple case, but it's really great to be able to do that and have that kind of built in to be able to like, just render something out that way. So, all right, I realize I'm close to the end here. I realize I haven't talked um, about C sharp features. And that's one other thing I wanna get to as I'm wrapping up, and then I think I could take a couple of uh, questions. Um, so in C Sharp, uh, 11 features, so that was in .NET 7. There's some neat stuff there in, got some here. So uh, we've had this whole thing with nullability. And so um, if you look in a, in a modern .NET app, you'll see this nullable enable, right? So this is enforcing nullability checks. Um, and this is something where we've actually throughout .NET Framework, or .NET um, SDK, we've turned on those nullable checks and we found and fixed a ton of stuff. So like it, it really does kind of help improve the quality of your code, right? So it looks for something, if you have a nullable thing and then later on you're not doing a null check on it, it's going to warn or error on that. Um, so that's great, but you do end up with some things like this, right? So here it's like, oh, and then I think, okay, well, should I make it nullable or should I set it to a default value or whatever? And in some cases, I know it's gonna be required and I'm going to enforce that uh, somewhere else like when I'm creating it. So here I can do, oops, required, right? And so, so now it doesn't need to do that nullability check because on the caller side, it's able to say, you're not setting a, a required thing. So that is that. Another neat thing is string literals. So um, let's say if I take this, and I could do, you know, like Bob, but what if my full name actually includes new lines, which would be pretty cool. Um, so I'm going to do here like that. Okay, we'll do that. Do I have enough? I need one more. Semicolon, three at the beginning, three at the end. Yay, it seems to work, I don't know. But the idea is I can do like, whoa, there it is, okay. Hello, Bob has a cool name, right? That's not the main use case is for people with new lines in their name, but it is actually super useful for things like if you need a bunch of JSON or you need like something that in includes multiple lines, right? So that's uh, string literals is a neat thing. That's a .NET 7 feature, or that is a C Sharp 11 feature. Um, and then looking ahead to C Sharp 12, um, I don't think I have a demo on that, but um, one really neat thing is primary constructors. And so that's something people have looked at for, asked for for a while. Um, so the idea is in your constructor, you can actually, um, you can, or in your class declaration, you can require things, and basically those are in scope for the, the class. So it's, it kind of saves a lot of, of code. Um, so that's that. Okay, so I think I've gone through. One thing that I do want to recommend is, again, this .NET Live TV. We have uh, ASP.NET. Um, the, there's great stuff that um, EF team has some really nice ones where they dig into features. I didn't even talk about EF, and there's tons of neat stuff they've been doing lately, things like um, hierarchy support and you know, really cool performance improvements, et cetera. So that is a great way. Honestly, that's a lot of how I stay up to date with things is um, you know, by going in and looking at those. So going way back, um, I, I just have a thank you slide here. So I'm gonna instead end with this thing here, right? So I wanna recommend, like, I showed you how easy it is, in most cases, to get started on updating to .NET 7, right? So you can flip your SDK, you can try it out, right? Your code's in source control, flip your SDK and say, hey, what does it work? Or how many errors did I get, right? Check it out. If, if it does turn out to be something where it's a, going to be a longer upgrade, we have tools for that with things like uh, Upgrade Assistant. And that upgrade tooling I showed you for ASP.NET, there's also tooling uh, for that with uh, Xamarin to Maui, um, for just for other application types as well. So uh, we actually have a huge um, uh, video series we just did 
So Mike on the team, uh, aka.ms, modernize ASP.NET. So this is a tutorial on that that'll walk you through. Um, but we also have, um, this is an 18 part video series. I actually helped edit some of these to get them out the door. So this is over three hours of video where he walks through a real application that's doing quite a bit of stuff, managing identity, managing session state, and all that. So get your apps on .NET 7, that's the first thing, and then get ready for .NET 8. There's some really cool stuff coming. I'm really excited as I'm watching things unfold with Blazor, um, and I think I've ended with enough time for some questions. There's supposed to be a Slido thing, is this right? Connection loss, it should have been a Blazor uh, United, or unification effort, okay. New productivity tools in .NET 8. Um, so there are some analyzers, there's productivity. Um, do things easier and faster. So I do think some of the C-sharp C -sharp 11, or C-sharp 12 features are nice, and, the, and um, that is definitely helpful. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, I don't remember anything specifically like in API controllers yet. Definitely, I think the productivity feature that I showed with route tooling is super useful, like, right? Because I can see immediately, I can see uh, the highlighting of, is this actually valid or is it, you know, like I can get refactoring off of that. So, so those are some things that, that come to mind for me. Um, let me see, <sighs> changes to .NET 8 in terms of multi-threading or async. I don't believe so. Uh, I'm, I'm not coming up with anything, so. All right, um, yeah. Are there other questions? I actually went really fast because I was like, I've got way too much stuff, I'm never gonna get through it all, and so I've t I talk super fast. I can try and fill time and you know, I can point you to some other, uh, let me point to you to one other thing. This is not filling time, this is actually really cool. Um, so I get to help edit the .NET blog, it is super fun. Um, and so let me point out some, some really useful things on here lately. Um, number one, we have been doing a, a ton of stuff with containers lately, um, so that is useful. Um, and you know, that's where you'll see, like this is where I keep up. When I'm talking about what's in C-sharp 12, I read what Kathleen wrote, right? Um, and so, so all these posts dig into that. Let me show you one huge thing. I think this is one of the, the most important things. Um, Authentication. Authentication has been a pain in ASP.NET for a while. Um, it's very easy to set up an app that just has username, password, login, right? That, that pretty much works. And that, that individual auth actually even works pretty well with associating with like a Google account, right? So it does the, the open ID connect and that sort of stuff. What gets more complicated is if you need to do things like host a spa or, or host a, an API and you need authentication on that. Um, if you wanna try and integrate with a token server, uh, then very quickly you get into kind of rolling and connecting a lot of things together, right? I'm sure some of you have got a huge amount of code and that took tons, of, I see some, some nods over there, it took a lot of stack overflow searching, some late nights, right? So that's definitely something we've been hearing over time is can you please fix off? And there's actually, um, out of many, there, there is a long running uh, you know, issue on that. Going, this, this is from 2022, but we've got some going back far longer than that. So as part of .NET 8, we've looked at that and, and said, yes, okay, we're going to fix that. So this is, this is our plan, and the, we're still at a point where you can have some impact on that. Um, but the idea is our plan, where's our plan? So, why did I skip through? There's our background, okay. So one thing is that the um, this identity server like is not going to be built in. It's so identity server is a great solution. It is free for a lot of cases. It is paid for larger enterprises. And there are also other great um, things out there like OpenIDict and, and Keycloak. And so basically those are available to plug in but they're not required on the installation. Um, and then this other big thing is improved authentication for self-hosted solutions. So if you are self-hosting an app and you need, to, you need to do like issue tokens and you need to be able to um, 
to work with JOT authentication, that sort of thing. That is something where we're working on making that a lot better. So in two ways, like one is improve the technology that we're shipping, but then number two, documentation, and make it better spelled out of, okay, you're trying to set that up, here's how you do it. So that is something, actually, I should have had a big slide on that, because that is an important kind of feature on that. So again, um, all these things, I keep up with these on the, um, the live.net and on our blog. So with that, I will, I guess, switch over to my last slide, and I'll thank you. <laughs>